a very good evening to all. I'm Dr. Rutra Mohan from IIT Digital Team. I'll be host for this webinar. The topic for the webinar is debunking the myths, current research on telemopathy and remote therapy intervention. The resource persons for today are Dr. Tejinder Singh and Dr. Stephen Schultz. Uh, this webinar is being organized by IIT Thane District Peace of Maharashtra State. Before we proceed with the webinar, I would like to uh, let you know a few things about the IIT Digital Team and the social media platforms. Uh, the IIT Digital Team consists of physiotherapists who handle the Zoom platform, webinar live streaming, and the social media pages of IIT on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can follow our social media pages to get regular notification during our events. You can subscribe to the IIT India YouTube channel for notification during live webinars. Uh, the links for the social media pages will be shared shortly in the chat box. I request the IIT panel team to please start with the webinar. Uh, Ma'am, can we wait for five more minutes so that more people can join in? I mean, can we share the attendees group or uh, attendees link on WhatsApp groups? Because usually we get like a lot more audience than what we have right now. If we can share it on like a public forum, I think more people can listen to this. It's a very, very relevant information, a very recent information. So. <laughs>
Shall we start with the introduction to the everyone joins? Hello, am I audible? Uh, you are audible, Dr. Ravi. So, good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome. We, uh, the Thane District team of Maharashtra Indian Association of Physiotherapy, along with Jim Physio, welcome you all for this webinar. The Thane District Maharashtra IP team have been working since three, four years to organize such events and in a way to work for the betterment of our profession. Our main motive is to always provide opportunities of learning and all, also in a way getting all the physiotherapists on one platform. Today, I'm taking this opportunity and would like to introduce to, your, to our esteemed speaker. They don't need any introduction. They are well-known people I'm now, ever since three, four years, they have been in India traveling and taking workshops. And let me introduce Dr. Tejinder Singh. He is basically born and raised in vibrant city of New Delhi, India. And Dr. TJ brings a wealth of experience and expertise to our clinical faculty. After relocating to Texas in 2008, he pursued his Bachelor of Science in Physiotherapy and later obtained a master in motor neuroscience. Dr. Singh's dedication to advancing his knowledge led him to achieve a decorative of physical therapy, specializing in orthopedics and sports. He is also certified in dry needling and holds the prestigious title of Fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic and Manual Therapy. Dr. Singh is the founder of Expert Manual Therapy, a renowned clinic in Austin where he provides exceptional care and rehabilitation services to his patient. Now, uh, let's talk about Dr. Steve. He is hailing from Zimbabwe. Dr. Steve brings a global perspective to our clinical faculty. Since moving to US in 2004, Dr. Steve has dedicated himself to a pursuit of excellence in physical therapy. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Health before attaining a doctorate of physical therapy. Dr. Fort, Dr. Fort's passion for orthopedic led him to become a certified orthopedic specialist and is also a skilled dry needling th a therapist. With a fellow of orthopedic and manual therapy, Dr. Fort committed to delivering personalized care and empowering patients to achieve their optimal health and wellness goals. He is the proud owner of ACE Physical Therapy, a premier clinic located in Dallas where he provides compassionate and effective rehabilitation services to this community. We are honored to have you, Dr. Tajinder Singh and Dr. Stephen Ford, as integral member of our, our clinical faculty, bringing their diverse backgrounds and extensive expertise to enrich the learning experience for all our participants. And now I hand, hand over this plat platform to Dr. TJ and Dr. Steve. Dr. Steve. Thank you, Thank you very much. You guys were so excited to be here with the IAP. Um, it's an honor for us, really. We're really happy to have all the other people that are listening in. Um, so welcome. So Dr. Tajinder and I go way back. We worked together for about three years. And during those three years, I think that I had a lot of what my mind uh, thought physical therapy was just radically changed and challenged. Dr. Tajinder Singh had been practicing uh, before uh, a few years before me and specialized and started a fellowship program a few years before me. And so he demonstrated 
some of the things that I saw that challenged me, that led me to pursue the journey that brought me here. So I remember in physical therapy school, I learned how to do a couple of things that today we look back and say, you know, the research doesn't really carry water. The research doesn't hold water for that. And so as times change and as things evolve, as physiotherapists, we have to be on the forefront of that. One of the things that one of you know my goals in being here, certainly one of Jem's goals, is to make the best kind of physiotherapists possible. And to me, the best kind of physiotherapist is one where a patient can come to that physiotherapist and get everything that they need. They don't. In America, we have patients that go to chiropractors and they go to PTs and they go to acupuncturists and they go to a personal trainer and, 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 and that's rubbish because physical therapists can do everything a patient needs. They have the ability if they're willing to put in the hard work and seek the training. And that's why Dr. Singh and I have alphabet soup list of credentials behind our names is because we've, we've chosen to pursue that. And once we got there, we said, we need our other PTs with us. We need to be able to provide the same thing for physiotherapists in the rest of the world for many reasons. For one, for the sake of the profession, right? It's our profession. We're proud of it. Um, but really, it's for the sake of the physiotherapists and their patients. Um, I have a couple of stories I like to tell. I'll give one or two. But um, before I do, I just I wanted to go back to when I was in physiotherapy school and talking about learning things that really we don't do a whole lot of anymore. So I remember in physiotherapy school, there was a lot of emphasis given to stretches. Here's how to stretch upper trapezius. And then if you turn the head a little bit, you can stretch levator scapulae. And I'm not saying it's not important to stretch our patients, but we start to look for why is upper, upper trapezius tight? Why is levator scapular tight? And if we address joint dysfunctions that are causing that hypertonicity, we don't even need to spend time stretching that muscle. And we actually got to the root cause. And instead of stretching for four weeks, we fixed the problem in one or two visits by doing a cervical manipulation. Um, there's also times when there's muscles that we stretch and upper trapezius is one of them where we spend time stretching it. And actually the muscle itself is already elongated it's already sitting in a lengthened position and you have to be able to identify if you're going to be stretching a muscle, like, is this muscle actually short? Does it actually need to be stretched or do we need to work on this person's ergonomics or does upper trapezius actually need strengthening? So if we see a shoulder girdle is depressed, of course, upper trapezius will be tight and sore, but stretching it is not the answer. We actually need to get this upper trapezius sitting in a better position. That's one example. Another example is in physiotherapy school at Texas Tech University, doctorate of physical therapy. We learned how to do transverse friction massage for lateral epicondylitis or for lateral epicondylopathy. And, you know, what they didn't emphasize in school, what I wish they had is that, you know, 75%, 80% of those lateral elbow pain patients are primarily a cervical issue. C5, C6. And what does the latest research say for how to address this lateral elbow pain? Manipulate C5, C6. Manipulate the elbow and manipulate the wrist. Did you guys learn that in physiotherapy school? Because I didn't. What's more is I didn't even learn how to do those techniques in physiotherapy school. I learned them after. And so Dr. Singh and I are trying to bring the latest research and not only the, the head knowledge, but the hands-on skills for how to do these things. Research that's widely available throughout the world. It, it makes me wonder why people are teaching anything else. Any other, I'm teaching this method, or I'm teaching this method, or this is my special method over here that I teach. Why are people even teaching that when there's clear research for you know, what we should be teaching, what we should be doing? that's shown to be effective. You know what I mean? So um, of course, as physiotherapists, we believe in an eclectic approach. We like to have lots of tools in our toolboxes, but at least you should have like the most effective ones, the ones that the research says. So one last example that I'll give, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about Gem, but that is, 
you know, in school, we learned about plantar fasciopathy or plantar fasciitis. And, um, you know, I remember the day that I was treating a patient for plantar fasciopathy in Dr. Singh's clinic, where we worked together. He was the director of the clinic at the time. And I was doing my massage. I was doing some foot strengthening. And um, Dr. Singh came over and said, no, 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 this is not how to treat this condition. And he did a few tests. And he said, yeah, this patient's pain, foot pain, is coming from the back and from the pelvis. And so he treated the back, he treated the pelvis, and after five minutes, asked the patient to walk, and the patient had significantly less pain. And my mind was blown. And in that moment, I was humbled. And I was a little bit frustrated because I didn't have that knowledge. But instead of instead of giving up or instead of just being frustrated, I said to myself, I need to learn this. So I, I rose to the occasion. So... Ultimately, this is why GEM exists. We want to bring these things to people everywhere, people that want to learn, people that are hungry. And we teach online and we teach hands-on seminars. We're actually coming to India. We're going to be in Delhi, um, I think in the first week of April, and then in Mumbai around the second week of April. So we really hope that you guys will join us. Um, yeah, Dr. Singh, do you have anything to say? No, I mean, I think I think you summed it up really well. I mean, the stuff we teach is a gap between your BPT, which is Bachelor's in Physiotherapy in India, and uh, fellowship trained therapists in the US, which we have only 3,500 or maybe 4,000 out of 350,000 therapists we have in the US. So that comes out to be around a little over 1%. And uh, yeah, not a lot of countries have fellowship programs. India does not have one. Countries like... Canada has a fellowship program. Ireland has a, has one. Scotland has one. Australia has one. But some of the common Commonwealth countries have a fellowship program, but most countries don't. And that's why there is this gap that exists. I mean, I get calls from patients from India. Whenever when we traveled to India last year, I still get phone calls from patients from India because they can't find a solution to their problem. And that's why we want to train therapists so that they can they can serve the community better. They can help the patients better. Are we good to start, Dr. Steve? Yeah, I'm ready. Add something. Yeah. So we picked this topic because the research on this topic has changed a lot since I graduated from PT school or since like in last last 20 years. And I still see people using certain treatment methods certain approaches which I think should not be used because this debate has been settled. So the topic of the presentation today is debunking the myths, current research on tendinopathy and manual therapy interventions. Okay. I think we've spoken about us a lot. I think Dr. Ravi has spoken about us. So I think let's move on. We are in Delhi from 7th to 12th and we're in Bombay from 14th to 19th. Yeah. We teach these long hours from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And these are our locations. And we're going to be talking about this topic, and that's more important. So I'll give a little background of why, why we're teaching this. Because when I was in PT school, we were, I think, and I'm very old. So I graduated from PT school in India in 2008. And there was a lot of emphasis and focus on using electrotherapy modalities. A lot of focus on, I think we had, we studied electrotherapy for two years or four semesters. I don't know how the curriculum is now. I think it's not very different as far as University of Delhi is concerned. So we spend a lot of time on doing, a lot, doing a lot of ultrasound, doing a lot of modalities, which helps in reducing inflammation, right? We do a lot of modalities when we're treating tendinitis, or treating fasciitis, we use a lot of modalities. We would do ultrasound to the heel, we would do ultrasound to the shoulder, we would do ultrasound to the elbow, we would do ultrasound to the various parts of the body, sometimes hip, if it's like uh, trochanteric bursitis or gluteal tendinitis. Okay. okay. So let's talk a little bit about tendinitis. And so Back in 1976, and there was only one study published back in 1976, 
And I'm going to talk about that study first because I just, I'm just trying to go in a chronological order. So this study was published in Italy by this gentleman called Giancarlo Pudu. He, what he did was he was treating Italian Olympic team. He saw a bunch of runners. They had, they had Achilles tendonitis or symptoms of Achilles tendonitis. Okay. And the idea was, idea was they did a biopsy study where they were trying to find what is causing the symptoms. Okay. They could not find any inflammatory cells, which means that they're treating this tendonitis, but there is no inflammation going on. So how do you call something as something tendonitis when there are no inflammatory markers? Because from our basic knowledge of pathophysiology, from our basic knowledge of pathology, we know that whenever there is an inflammation, the inflammatory markers go up. Okay. So this was a study published in 1976. Sadly, for two decades, nothing, nobody did a follow up work on this until Dr. Kareem Khan back in 1999 started researching this in the University of British Columbia in Canada and started to look at this stuff and kind of settle this debate by publishing a lot of literature for next decade. Yeah. So we're going to try to understand these terminologies first. What is tendonitis? What is tendinosis? And what is tendinopathy? There are three terms. So let's talk about tendonitis, which I think we study a lot in the PT school. I think we, we spoke about this diagnosis a lot. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on this in exercise therapy, electrotherapy. So tendonitis is basically you have a tendon and I'll show you a picture of a healthy tendon. Yeah. You see this stuff on the left side, that is your tendon. Yeah. You have beautiful collagen tissue type one primarily, densely packed. Okay. And when this tendon is inflamed, there's an intratendinous inflammation. We call it tendonitis. Okay. But there is a there is a problem. Okay. When Dr. Kareem Khan started studying this back in 1999 and for, for next decade, he found when he was look, using light microscope, he was using histology, when he was using uh, he was using biopsy, he was not finding any inflammatory signs. So how do we call something tendonitis when I mean, there are no inflammatory markers? Okay. So he gave a term called tendinosis. And tendinosis is nothing but the tissue is in state of degeneration. Tissue has degenerated and it could be tendon. And that study was start, started with tendon, went to fascia, went to bursa, and they were finding similar findings where they were finding, they were not finding any inflammatory markers. Okay. So, so there was a debate in, the, and if there is no tendonitis, why are we using phonophoresis? Why are we using anti-inflammatories? Why are we giving patient naproxen? Why are we giving patient TENS, right? All the anti-inflammatory stuff, which was very, very prevalent in 80s and 90s in the North America, in the US and Canada, when there is no inflammation going on, why are we using this, okay? Yeah. So he came up with this term called as tendinopathy. Tendinopathy simply means pain is originating from the tendon. Okay. Patient usually would have very little pain at rest, but reduced performance. Okay. When you ask the patient to activate the muscle, and that's how we test as a physical therapist, when patient comes to us, how do we test? Supraspinatus tendinitis, we test the empty can. Infraspinatus, we do resisted external rotation, like different positions, right? But this, these patients were not having or were having very little pain at rest, but when they moved, they had a lot of pain. So the new terminology that came along after his research was tendinosis or tendinopathy. Okay. Okay, let's try to understand from microscopic level what tendinopathy is. Okay. So I'm going to show you a picture. I think this is of very relevant information. So if you look at the picture on the left, if you look at the blue arrow, 
that is your healthy tendon. If you look at the red picture or red arrow, this is your unhealthy tendon, okay? On the left side, you see these tightly packed collagen fibers, which is type one, very tightly packed, beautifully packed. This is how a healthy tendon looks like when you look, in, look under a light microscope, okay? Look at the unhealthy tendon, you have, the collagen fibers have become thinner, Okay, and there is more type three collagen. So you have type one, type two, type three. Type two is present more in cartilage, type one is present more in tendon. But this type three is, we call it state of disrepair, which means that the tendon is repairing. Okay, and there is a lot of swelling around it. Okay, you see there's a lot of swelling around it. And that has happened because of this structural changes or structural damage Okay. okay, and then that is leading to fibrosis, okay? So it's not inflammation that is causing the causing patient symptoms. It's the structural damage. And if it's, if it's not inflammation, we should not be using anti-inflammatory. All the electrotherapic modalities are useless, okay? Because our focus should be on improving, improving, the health of the collagen tissue. But the question is, how do we improve the health of the collagen tissue? How do we improve the quality of this collagen tissue and strength of this collagen tissue? And we're gonna talk about that, yeah. Okay. So a little more information here, okay. So tendinopathy is nothing but, it's a pain in the tendon resulting in reduced performance of the tendon. Okay. Tendon is not able to, the, the, the function of the tendon is to help the muscle produce force. That function is lost or impaired. Okay. Light microscopy shows collagen separation, which is, you can see how the fibers are not densely packed here. Okay. They look thin, damaged. Okay. And another important factor this they found was there was a lot of cellular proliferation. Okay, there was a lot of cellular proliferation on light microscopy. Can anybody tell me what is the function of tendon cells? Anybody can tell me what tenocytes function of tenocytes is? I'm gonna write it on the chat so you can tell me the functions of people who teach or people who remember stuff or people who graduated from college recently. Can anybody tell me what is the function of tenocytes? These are tendon cells. What do they do? Anybody? Are you guys listening? Tensile strength. Tendon forming cells, I like that answer. So the idea of tenocytes is to improve collagen production, okay? And we know that this tendon is, does not need anti-inflammatory, this tendon needs more tenocytes. And when you see more tenocytes in the tissue, you already know that this tendon is trying to heal. What we can do as a therapist is important. And we're gonna talk about that, how we can promote or facilitate this process of tendon healing, okay? And the answer is not anti-inflammatories. The answer is not using ultrasound phonophoresis. The answer is understanding what is causing this tendon to be in a state of disrepair, okay? okay. These are the basic components of a tendon. You have the primarily type one collagen fibers, and then you have this matrix, and then you have the primary tenocyte cell that are responsible for production of the type one collagen fibers so that these cells stay densely packed. Yeah. I'm gonna talk about, this is a very, very interesting article because in I think back in 2003, Kareem Khan came up with this conclusion that these are the processes that are happening at a histopathological level that that explains that this is not a tendonitis, okay? And we're gonna talk about the difference between a tendinopathy and a tendonitis, 
how they present and how we should treat them. 99% of patients you are seeing in the clinic are not your tendonitis patients because tendonitis is very rare and sometimes it resolves on its own. Okay, most of the time it resolves on its own. So all the patients you are seeing in the clinic are not tendonitis. Okay, I know you. a lot of us still use modalities on it. Yeah, yeah. So histopathologically, what is happening is saying it, saying it again, saying it again, your collagen fibers are degenerated and disoriented. Okay. Whenever your tissue is de degenerated or disoriented, the force production is less. Okay. The collagen fiber looks thinner. Okay. And because it's in a state of disrepair, you have something called as revascularization, which means that you have more blood vessels and something called as neovascularization, which means you have newer blood vessels forming in the tissue, okay? And whenever you see that in the tissue on a light microscopy, that tells you that it's a degenerated tissue which is trying to heal. But the question is why the tissue has become degenerated, okay? Or why the tendon has become degenerated? And that's what we can answer with manual therapy. That's what we can answer with clinical reasoning. That's what we can answer with our understanding of what we are trying to fix. I always say that manual therapy is not about popping and cracking. Manual therapy is about understanding what we have to do. Okay. So, so tendinosis or tendinopathy is nothing but it's a degenerative process with the presence of presence of absence of inflammatory cells and presence of all the markers that tells us that tissue is trying to heal. Okay. Any questions till now, guys? I hope you're understanding the difference between tendonitis and tendinopathy and why, why understanding this is very important. Okay. And the crazy thing is I still receive patients from the physicians saying rotator cuff tendinitis. And this debate was settled like 20 years ago. This is not a recent study. This is 2003. We are in 2024. I still get patients, physicians write plantar fasciitis or trochanteric bursitis, right? It is not bursitis. It is not fasciitis. I'm sure you guys who are... I'm gonna talk about the factors that are affecting it. And I have some case studies explaining what is causing this degeneration, okay? Okay, we're gonna talk about that. And I'll give you examples of what is causing this and how we can improve this process. I'm currently working with this patient in the clinic and she has been diagnosed with trochanteric bursitis for 20 years. She has this trochanteric bursitis for 20 years. How, how can that happen? And she had all sorts of anti-inflammatory stuff done to her. Nothing changed her, changed her symptoms. So we're going to talk about that. Okay. So we're going to talk about what mechanisms are causing this. Okay. And there are certain mechanisms that we can modify or change. And there are certain mechanisms, of course, we cannot change. Okay. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about stress strain curve. We always talk about this going back to the basic biomechanics. So in the blue, you see this is a healthy curve which means that you have stress where you're putting pressure on the tendon and then you have strain here. You can see a solid 45 degree angle, which means that when you put stress on it, the tissue deformation happens, okay? Your tissue is changing in length, very symmetrically, good solid 45 degree angle. When you see the curve in blue or in, in red or orange, you can see the change in change in length or change in strain with respect to stress is not very good. And that explains the reduced performance of the tendon. And what will happen if you keep continue to put stress on it, you will reach the ultimate failure point very soon, leading to rupture of the tendon. Okay, We talk about this stuff in our foundation class in much more detail. Okay. If you have any admin related questions, I mean, please reach out to Dr. Dhumi or Dr. Ravi. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a stress strain curve. 
In the blue, you see the control, which is healthy tendon. In the, in the orange or red, you see a tendinopathy. Okay. okay. Let's talk about the classification given by Bonner. And I'm going to talk about tendinosis. And then we're going to talk about how you can have like some tendinitis of the outer layer. Yeah, because of the tendinosis. So tendinosis, tendinosis is nothing but intratendinous intra degeneration. So you're having this state of disrepair where your tissue is disorganized, disoriented, and has lost the capacity to produce, to produce force. Okay. And then you have tendinitis, which is presence of some inflammatory response. Okay. Okay. And then in certain situations, what can happen is you can have an underlying tendinosis and, and that continues to happen and can cause some inflammation of the outer layer of the tendon, which is called peritonitis. Yeah. So inflammation of the outer layer, outer covering of the tendon is called peritonon and then swelling of that is called peritonitis. Okay. But even if this process happens, inflammatory cells are not very many because the underlying cause is still the tendinosis. Okay. And if you're finding patients with pain at rest, you can suspect some form, some tendinitis, but it is very, very rare. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. So let's talk about the prevalence. And this is a very, very critical slide because if you see stuff on the left, prevalence of tendinosis is very, very common. And you look at overuse tendinitis, it's very rare. I think this is important to understand because whenever we see patients, we, see, we look at the onset of symptoms, we look at, look at the, the symptoms at rest, we look at the symptoms with activity. And this slide beautifully explains which category most of your patients will fall into. Okay. Most of your, most of your patients will fall into the category of overuse tendinosis, which means that prevalence is common. 95 to 99%, Dr. Kareem Khan says 95 to 99% of patients that come to an outpatient clinic falls into the category of tendinosis. Okay. They might develop some secondary tendinitis later on if untreated. And that makes the that makes the prognosis very very poor. Okay, time for full recovery two to three months. Tendinitis you can see resolves on its own in two weeks. Okay, so if you even if you don't do anything or you give like an opioid or a medication for a week, patient will patient will be fine. Okay. This is where the problem is, the challenge is. And the important thing is to understand what is happening. Why the tissue has, why the tendon has to go in this state of degeneration. Okay. And we'll talk about that. Likelihood of full recovery, 80%. Tendinitis is easy to resolve. 99% of tendinitis resolves on its own. Okay. So we don't see that. I mean, if they resolve, if something resolves on its own, patients will highly unlikely to see you, right? And in certain situations, you can do surgery. And we see that all the time. And the time to recover is four to six months for tendinosis, okay? So please keep your focus on the left side of the screen because that's your primary patient population. Right side of the screen, you might see one patient here and there, but most, most of your patients don't come and for a week or week one or week two, right? They usually come after a few weeks because the symptoms are not resolving with medications or heat or moist heat or whatever they're trying, right? Yeah. Does it, do you guys understand the difference between tendin tendinosis, tendinitis and tendinopathy now? Do you want to repeat anything again? Because if you don't understand this much, you're not gonna understand anything moving forward. Do you guys understand the difference between tendinosis, tendinitis, and tendinopathy? Are you guys there? Yeah. 
So I'm going to say this in like very brief. Briefly, tendonitis is inflammation of intratendinous material. So with, within the tendon, you have you have this inflammation. As per literature, it is a very rare problem. Yeah, it's not very common. It's usually self-limiting, resolves on its own within first two weeks. Tendinosis or tendinopathy is usually a state of degeneration, which means that the collagen tissue has degenerated. Okay. And there is a kind of a repair process going on within the tendon. Okay. There is increase in tenocytes in that area. There is increase in blood vessels in the area. There is increase in vascularization of that area. And it tends to look like something like this. Okay. See that red arrow? Looks like this. The fibers are thin and degenerated. They're trying to repair. Okay. There is a lot of cell death going on. And so there is a lot of repair going on. Okay. But the question is why the tissue has degenerated. That's the question. Yes, it's overused, but why that specific tissue? Okay. Then we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Because yeah. let's talk a little bit about clinical features. You ha can have acute subacute, I mean, all of us define acute, subacute, chronic differently, but for the sake of literature, this is how Dr. Kareem Khan defines it. Chronic is greater than 12 weeks, okay? And that's where I think most of our patients fall into. They have tendinopathy and ten tendinosis going on for a while, and then they decide to see us, right? Tendinopathy and tendinosis is very similar, yes. Yeah. Tissues that are affected are tendon and thesis is nothing but the site of attachment of the tendon. And you can have paratenon being affected or paratendon being affected and then your tenosynovial sheet could be affected. Yeah. So structures around tendon are getting affected in tendinosis. You can have a little bit of swelling of the outer, a little bit of inflammation of the peritonon. Yeah. We decide degree of tissue disruption as less than 10% could be grade one, 10 to 50% could be grade two, greater than three, greater than grade three could be more than 50%. The point is when you see patients in the clinic, it's hard to hard to decipher or hard to find out how much how what grade this patient falls into. But on I think ultrasound, we can we can we can figure out the roughly if we can figure out whether it's grade one or grade two. Yeah. Now the now why it is happening and that's that's very very important. Okay, that's very very important. Why you have this rotator cuff tendinosis going on? Why you have? So by the way, if I talk about the literature, doctor Dr. Karim Khan study, I think five types of tendinitis. It was used to be called tendinitis. So he he was looking at five he published like five these five articles on plantar fasciitis, uh, trochanteric bursitis. Rotator cuff tendinitis, okay, lateral elbow, and I think Achilles tendinitis. And obviously, so that he can extend his finding, findings from one study to another, he studied and he was trying to look for inflammatory markers in all these tissues, and he found none. Okay, and it's a big sample size. So, so let's talk about the cause. Why is it happening? Some of the factors could be family history, sex, age, anatomical variations, but the single most important factor, and that's why it's highlighted is biomechanics, okay? Because the overuse injury, there is some biomechanical fault in your body that is putting a lot of stress on the tendon. And now you're using that tendon with the biomechanical stress being put on it has caused this state of degeneration. A state of disrepair. Okay. 
Extrinsic factors could be training errors, your work or sport demands. Okay. And certain medical conditions, we know that rheumatoid arthritis or your diabetes or your collagen tissue disorder, Allard-Danlos syndrome, or maybe your Shijogren syndrome, various conditions that can cause can cause tendinopathies. Okay. But the single most important factor or single most important factor we can modify with manual therapy interventions, with treatment, with our understanding is biomechanics. Okay. If you understand the biomechanics, you can improve, improve the tendon health. And that's what we are trying to, trying to understand. You, because it's not tendonitis, it's tendinopathy. We have to understand why this, this is happening. Okay. And I'll try to explain some of the mechanisms. I'll try, I have three case studies, so I'll try to explain this, why this tendinosis is happening. Okay. Just by doing anti-inflammatories or a, attacking that tissue with needling or attacking that tissue with cupping is not a solution because understanding what is happening is a solution. Okay. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the case study one. And I've picked most common diagnosis so that you understand, because this is what we see mostly in the clinics as far as tendinitis or tendinosis is concerned. Okay. Yeah. So my patient is a 50 year old amateur tennis player presented with pain in the right anterior lateral shoulder. This patient has pain here. Okay. And obviously when they go to a physician, they usually write rotator cuff tendinitis. So the patient came with the diagnosis of rotator cuff tendinitis. Yeah. Symptoms are gradual and has become worse in the last two years. And most patients will tell you that they don't come to you in first week or two. They usually come to you after a few months or a year or a couple of years. Okay. So patient has pain with doing overhead tasks and hitting doing a tennis serve. Okay. This is the di this is the diagnosis. Now we're going to look at the biomechanical findings and see where this why this patient has symptoms here. What is causing this tendon to work too much? Okay. If you look at the impingement findings, we know that rotator cuff problems tend to originate from signs of impingement, right? So you look at the knees test, you look at the Hawkins Kennedy test, they're positive. Most of the patients who have rotator cuff problems, you will find these tests to be positive. Yeah. But that's not the point. You do a resisted external rotation, you do a lift off. Res resisted external rotation is for infraspinatus stelis minor. Lift off, that is it. For subscapularis, both are positive. Okay. So these are these are, I would say, like kind of signs of signs of rotator cuff tendinopathy. But when you look at the biomechanical picture, that will explain why this these tendons are working too much. Okay. We look at the sh shoulder range of motion. You look at the flexion, abduction, a little bit restricted. External rotation is restricted. Medial rotation is 40 degrees, a, a lot of restriction there. And you look at the cervical range of motion, you have restriction in the neck. We know that restrictions in the neck in cervical thoracic spine can affect the position of the shoulder. Okay, Can cause maybe anterior humeral translation in this situation because your posterior glide is limited. Okay. Okay. You look at the scapular position, downward rotated. You check the rib cage, second, third, fourth rib is positive or springing is positive. So they are sitting in dysfunction and your AC joint is tender to palpation and you have cervical thoracic hypermobility and extension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think I want to go slow here so that you guys understand this because it's about understanding what is causing this tendinosis. So you have this patient who's presenting symptoms here. Okay. You do a physical exam and you're finding you you're finding all this. Yeah. You're finding all this. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you these questions because I think your understanding is important here. So when somebody comes to you and who has restriction in rotation, what would you check next? Okay. What would you check next? If you have right rotation 50 degrees, what is your what is your next thought process? What would you check? Anybody? So if somebody is rotating the neck 
only 50 degrees to one side, 85 degrees to the other side, what would you check next? I think GERD, I know it's GERD, but you have to give, you have to understand why GERD is happening. I'm adding a, an extra layer of your understanding. That's the, that's the point. So if somebody has restriction in medial rotation, yes, this patient has six scapula syndrome, but why six scapula syndrome is happening, that's what I'm trying to make you understand. Okay. Just working on scapular stabilizers will not resolve the symptoms. And that's what we have been taught in PT school, right? Just work on scapular stabilizers, work on work on your middle and lower trapezius and that it will fix it. That might help a little bit, but you have to understand why, why it is happening. Yes, you're getting signs. You're just explaining the signs of impingement. Yes, I know that there's, there's a sign, sign, there are signs of impingement, but why the signs of impingement are happening? That's what we're trying to understand. Okay. I'm just trying to add a layer of complexity to, the, to your problem solving so that you understand why this is happening. Okay. Yes, there is dyskinesia, but why dyskinesia? That's what we're trying to understand. Okay. Yeah. So tell me why this, when you have somebody comes to you and they can rotate 50 to one side, 85 to the other side, what do you check next? Humeral antiversion, sternocleidomastoid, no. What do you check if somebody is, has rest, severe restriction to one side compared to the other side? What, what do you check? not sternocleidomastoid, not humeral antiversion. My patient is not able to, my patient came to me with shoulder pain, right? And he's not able to turn the neck. Anybody? People who are in our program can answer this easily. Some of you who are part of our, part of the GEM cohort one or two can answer, should answer this. Okay. Where is most of the rotation come? Where, where is most of rotation comes from in the neck? Anybody? Upper cervical. Well, what would I check? I would check C1, 2, C2, C3. I think Dr. Steve actually explained this case study to us even before the lecture. He was talking about upper trapezius levator scapula becoming hypertonic. Will that, if you have stiffness in the neck, will that cause the, cause the, cause, the, cause hypertonicity? Absolutely. Will that affect the position of the shoulder blade? Absolutely. Right? Okay. What does medial rotation restriction tells you? Okay, so we know that this patient has restriction in the cervical rotation, something is not right with C1, 2, C2, 3. How about medial rotation in the shoulder? What does that tell you? The patient is not able to do this. What, what is missing? You can do cervical mobilization. There's no problem with that. But understanding is important. Manual therapy is about understanding. What needs to be done, where it should be done, when it should be done. Okay. Yep. So this patient has restriction in medial rotation. What does this tell you? Anybody? Foundational biomechanics, guys. Hmm. Okay, so this patient is missing the posterior glide, right? Yeah, so this patient is missing posterior glide. Patient has restriction in cervical rotation. So I would address this biomechanical fault. I would address this biomechanical fault right away. Okay. Second, third, fourth rib is positive. What do you? What would you do with that? Your second, you have a second rib dysfunction. You have a third rib dysfunction. You have a fourth rib dysfunction. 
Would you address that? What muscle originates from third and fourth rib and attaches the shoulder blade? Anybody? Basic anatomy. If you have a third rib, fourth rib is painful. Can anybody tell me? Okay, serratus anterior. What else? Pec minor. That's a great answer. A lot of times you'll find patients who would come to you and they will report pain here on the coracoid. Okay. A lot of your impingement, rotator cuff tendinosis patients will say, I hurt here. Okay. I hurt here. Okay. And that is a pectoralis minor hypertonicity. Okay. And this patient has AC joint tender to palpation. If you guys know the most sensitive test for AC joint is tender to palpation. Yeah, 96% sensitivity. Yeah. And then you have cervical thoracic hypermobility, which means that this patient has missing extension in cervical thoracic spine. Okay. No wonder this patient has rotator cuff tendinosis because all these biomechanical findings are putting too much stress whenever he's serving. Right? With all these biomechanical faults, it is putting way too much pressure when he's trying to serve. Okay, and I can keep putting ultrasound here, put keep putting phonophoresis here, keep putting tens here, it's not gonna fix anything. It's a waste of his time and my time. Unless I fix the impeding or biomechanical factors. And that's why evidence for manual therapy, evidence for understanding, evidence for clinical reasoning is, is level one. Okay. Yeah. So we need to re reduce the signs of impingement. We need to reduce what is causing rotator cuff tendons to work too much. If, if your humeral head is sitting forward and, the, and all the muscles, all the rotator cuff muscles are in tension because of this altered position, every time he elevates, there is too much stress on the tendons and it's going to cause state of disrepair. I can keep applying soft tissue modality. It's not going to do anything. Because I need to first treat what is causing the stress on these tendons. Fix the underlying biomechanics. Fix the second, third, fourth, fifth rib dysfunction. Fix the scapular position. Fix the AC joint mobility. Fix the cervical thoracic extension. Okay. Fix the cervical rotation. C1, 2, C2, 3. One of you mentioned. Fix this internal rotation GRID by improving the posterior glide. When I fix all this, my rotator cuff tendons are now happy because they are not sitting in tension. They can breathe now. Now I can go and do a tendon rehab. Okay. And that's how, and when you do tendon rehab, there is no, there is no stress on the tendons now because I fixed the underlying biomechanical environment. Now, and, and do eccentric training, do different types of rehab. Alfredson, one of the articles published by Alfredson, he's done like tons of research on tendon rehab. He spoke about how many repetitions should you use. In one of his studies, which is actually one of the landmark studies published on tendon rehab, he used, I think, 15,000 repetitions for the over, over, the, over the period of three months, which was around 174 repetitions per day. That research was kind of there were follow-up studies done which they found that if you do 150 to 200 repetitions in a day, you facilitate tendon healing, you facilitate activity of tenocytes. And that's why research is important. Okay. So how would I approach this? I would I would treat all the biomechanics, correct all the biomechanics, and then use Alfredson's work. I even tell my patients, if I'm treating gluteal tendinopathy or patients with rotator cuff tendinopathy, I need these many repetitions in a day. I don't know. If you want to get better, if you want to fix this chronic tendinosis, make sure you do 150 to 200 repetitions in a day. Maybe pick five exercises and try to hit 40 repetitions. Okay. Yeah. 
and make sure focus on eccentrics, but make sure you're doing these many repetitions in a day because that is the exercise prescription for tendon. If you want to create tenocyte proliferation, if you want to improve collagen tissue laid down, you have to do these many repetitions. Otherwise, I mean, not everything is three sets of 10. Okay. And that's why research is important. And that's why we teach this program. So understanding this again, it is tendino tendinosis, not tendinitis. We're going to fix the underlying biomechanical factors in manipulations. I like to do manipulations because they're easy. If my patient does not have any underlying contraindications, I would just go and manipulate the shoulder or mobilize the shoulder, manipulate the cervical spine, C1, 2, C2, 3. Manipulate the ribs, second, third, fourth. Manipulate the cervical thoracic, mobilize the AC. In some situations, manipulate the AC. Align all this. And I have done this where a patient came to me and I did. Empty can was like strongly positive. I corrected all this and I did empty can. Empty can is negative now. Okay. I did not even touch the supraspinatus tendon. Empty can is negative because we have fixed the underlying biomechanical factors. Okay. And that's how you treat tendinosis. Okay. And then of course, after that, you would do a tendon rehab. Okay. I'm going to demonstrate a technique here. I think Dr. Steve is performing this technique. Okay. So let's watch this. I'm going to turn off the volume. Yeah. You can target cervical thoracic spine or you can target second rib with this technique. And it's a very simple technique. I'm going to actually turn on the volume on this little patient. Yeah. That feels so good. Box. <laughs> Like that cereal, right? Gotta have my pops. Wow. Oh. Yeah, so this is how you address tendinosis. Fix the underlying biomechanical faults, create good biomechanical environment for your rotator cuff muscles, and then do the tendon rehab. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna talk about case. Any questions regarding this case study? Anything you want me to uh, anything you want me to repeat? I hope it improved your understanding on how to address a simple problem which we see in the clinic all the time, right? Yeah. Any questions regarding this case study? Next time you see rotator cuff tendinosis or rotator cuff tendinopathy, make sure you're treating from this approach. Okay, and it will take you some time to understand Not all one-day manipulations can fix all the things, no. I would not say that. I would fix the underlying biomechanical faults first. If you're experienced, if you're experienced, if you've done this for a while, you can do all the manipulations in a day and you can fix 80, 90% of the things. But if you're a newbie, if you're learning this stuff, it would take you some time. Because to be able to manipulate every segment effectively, efficiently. When patients can extreme and severe joint irritation, I mean, I think that comes down to the skill. If you have been practicing for a while and you can do it, but if you have been, if, you, if, if you're not confident, then you can start with mobilizations. What? One of the things that we teach and talk about when it comes to, you know, manual therapy, you know, yeah, you can go and, and get your neck popped by the barber down the street. But the thing is, like, it's a really highly skilled um, intervention. And, you know, it's easy to make someone who's not in pain pop, right? You can pop their neck or pop their back. That's cool. When somebody has pain, now the stakes are raised. Are they appropriate for manipulation? What's the actual diagnosis? Is manipulation safe? Is the patient too irritable for a grade five, which is when we actually pop the joint? Are they more appropriate for grade one, grade two mobilizations? 
And so there is a hefty amount of clinical reasoning um, that goes into which intervention do we do on a patient when. And so I would say that as 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 a as a newer manual therapist back in the day when I was learning a lot of these techniques, my clinical reasoning was not as good, or my diagnosing was a little bit lazy um, or uninformed. Then I had way more adverse reactions, um, and so that's part of when we teach manipulations, dry needling, and other interventions. It's important to realize that it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's not a one size fits all. You actually have to talk to the patient and understand what's going on. You have to put your hands on the patient and understand what's going on at the tissue level. And so it's it's quite skilled, actually. It's, it's quite skilled. But you know what? I can tell you that it is skilled because I have patients that come and tell me that, that I'm better than any chiropractor that they've ever seen and better than any physical therapist that I've ever seen. And I'm not saying that to brag on myself, but just to say that all, all PTs can get there. Actually, in physiotherapy school, I was pretty, I was probably one of the worst ones at manual therapy, but just through time and effort and perseverance, you know, I think that I have become quite a skilled therapist and that's possible for anybody out there who wants that. So, but yeah, I mean, adverse reactions can happen, but through clinical reasoning and proper education that really can be minimized, that really can be minimized. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, just simplifying this case study a little bit because one of you are asking questions. So if you're treating cervical spine, or you, if you're treating shoulder, make sure you assess cervical spine, you assess thoracic spine, you assess rib cage. We always emphasize on regional interdependence, which means that one region is dependent on the other region. Okay, If you have shoulder issue, you're going to have like cervical issue, you're going to have thoracic because you're going to have some segmental restriction in other segments. Make sure that you're addressing it. Yes, cervical thoracic problems. I mean, there have been like hundreds of studies published on this stuff. I mean, you can look at work by Cleland. Cleland has published probably 20 articles by himself on this, this stuff. Okay. And back in in last 20 years. So assess cervical thoracic spine, assess upper, upper cervical spine, assess rib cage when you're trying to trying to address symptoms of tendinosis. Okay, because you're gonna find biomechanical. There is a reason why this patient has rotator cuff issue going on, right? And if you're just gonna do shoulder exercises, you're not doing anything actually. This patient is gonna probably have like a surgery down the line because you've not treated the underlying impingement. You're basically making him exercise in the position of impingement or in the in impingement position. So you're gonna probably if you keep exercising like this. If you keep doing, if he's sitting in impingement position and you keep doing rotator cuff exercises, you're going to cause a great three tear. Do you agree with me, Dr. Steve, on this? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, in before I became a manual therapist, you know, hearing about joint dysfunctions, it's like, it's like going on safari. You know what I mean? I, I'm sorry, I'm from Zimbabwe. It's like going on safari. Like, yeah, we might see a leopard today, guys. Leopards are hard to see. I've seen a leopard maybe once or twice in my life. So I was thinking the same thing about joint dysfunctions. People talk about these things, but they're not really there. And now I can tell you, if a patient comes in for shoulder pain, I promise you there'll be a cervical facet dysfunction. There will be a rib dysfunction and their thoracic spine and CT will probably be hypomobile. And those things will cause or contribute to pain in the shoulder, the imbalance that's found in the shoulder, you know, poor scapular mechanics. And so we have to get our heads out of this idea that shoulder pain patients, elbow pain patients, foot pain patients, and start to see the body as a whole and treat with what we call regional interdependence. It's a concept that's been around for a long time. Hopefully everybody's familiar with that, but just the understanding that we're never treating an isolated body part because a knee is not just a knee. A knee is contributed to from the hip, the ankle, the SI joint and the lumbar spine. Um, and if we're treating a leg that has neural tension, we have to treat the thoracic spine as well. If there's any numbness or tingling in the legs, you should be treating the thoracic spine. In fact, you should manipulate it because that has neuromodulatory effects on the nervous system. 
Um, and so you're, you, we have to get out of the box of treating just one simple body part at a time. A shoulder is not just a shoulder. It's a part of a system and you have to treat the whole system. Um, maybe 90% of the problem is in the shoulder and only 10% of the problem is elsewhere. You have to treat that 10% or maybe 90% of the problem is in the neck, ribs, um, thoracic spine and stuff like that, shoulder girdle. And only 10% of the problem is the fact that the patient actually has like a rotator cuff tear or a ro rotator cuff tendinopathy. So you do, you have to treat the whole system. Doesn't matter like how, what percentage of the problem is what you have to treat the whole thing. Okay. We're going to go to, uh, go to case study two, and we're going to talk about this because this is another common patient presentation you see in the clinic. Okay. So we all, all of us treat lateral elbow pain, right? So my patient here is a 36 year old computer programmer presented with pain in the right lateral elbow. Okay. Symptoms are gradual and has become worse in the past year. Patient does report a clear episode when he was playing badminton 18 months ago. He felt like some lateral elbow pain and then symptoms have become gradually worse. Difficult patient has difficulty in typing, ADLs and gripping. We do, whenever patients come to us with lateral elbow pain, we always check the tendons. That's our go-to thing, right? We check the extension. We check the radial deviation. I think, uh, so one of you are asking me, what if the pain is in the middle of the ankle? What tendon must be involved? It, it, it's not necessarily a tendon issue. You need to give me more information. It could be an ankle, it could be a joint dysfunction purely, or it could be an it could be a knee issue, it could be a pelvis issue, it could be a low back issue. Okay. So if this patient comes to you, you will say this patient has tennis elbow, right? But why these tendons have become why why these tendons have become painful? That's the question I'm asking. Yes, we know that pain is. Tennis elbow is nothing but means that pain is originating from the tendon because these tests are positive. But that doesn't tell me anything. Okay, it doesn't give me any information. That doesn't guide my treatment. Because if I keep doing the extension exercises or keep doing the mid-prone flexion, it's not gonna fix anything, right? So let's understand. The idea is to add more layers in your clinical reasoning, okay? Add more layers. So. Look at the wrist range of motion. Extension is 40 degrees, flexion is 80. Radial deviation is 70, ulnar deviation is 80. Okay. Right rotation is slightly restricted compared to the left. Okay. This patient may have what Dr. Steve was mentioning, a mid cervical issue. Patient, because we know that elbow is supplied primarily by C5, C6. So this patient may have a C5, C6 issue. We don't know. We may have to check. So this patient does have something going on in the neck, mild restriction in neck rotation. So this patient might have a mid cervical issue. Okay. Clear restriction in extension because your extension is usually 70 to 80 degrees. The patient only has wrist extension of four, extension of 40 degrees. Okay. And when we check for the, we find scaphoid unit joint, the scaphoid is tender to palpation, radial head is tender to palpation. Okay. Okay, so yes, this person has has tendinosis. Clearly, if multiple tendons that originate from the common extensor region are pointing towards tendon pain, we know that. But what is causing it is what we are we are adding an extra layer. Okay, if you look at the wrist extension being severely restricted, if I'm only able to extend my wrist to this much, okay, okay. This will produce great amount of tension on the elbow, right? Because my extension is this much, right? Should be this, but it's this much. Every time I do a typing task or I lift or I use my arm for ADLs, I'm putting crazy amount of tension here. And also, if you look at this patient does not have uh, superior radial nerve joint mobility, okay? Yes, I can do all the tendon rehab I want, but I have to fix, create good biomechanical environment for this these tendons first, which, which would be improving the wrist extension. Okay. 
Just to give you an example, I think there's a study published by Kaufman in 2005. And he spoke about that scaphoid contributes to 92% of 92 or 93% of wrist extension. So if your scaphoid is displaced, it will put a lot of pressure on the elbow. Okay. And we know that scaphoid can contribute so much to wrist extension. This person has 40 degrees of wrist extension. And scaphoid unit joint, the joint between scaphoid and unit is tender. So we know that there's a positional fault or joint dysfunction happening at scaphoid unit joint. And to, we need to fix this scaphoid unit joint dysfunction if you want to fix this problem, right? You cannot create a good biomechanical environment if your wrist extension is this much. You need to, you need to go and manipulate that scaphoid so that wrist, you can restore that wrist extension, okay? So that produces good, good biomechanical environment for the, for the common extensor region, okay? And manipulate the superior radial inner joint, which is also very tender to palpation, yeah? And also this patient has some restriction in the neck. We're gonna resolve that. Okay, it's not a lot of restriction, but mid cervical may may have mid cervical restriction, which Dr. Steve was talking about. So, if you want to address this, we, I'm going to fix. I'm going to fix the mid cervical rotation, or going to assess mid cervical mid cervical spine, fix that, improve cervical rotation, improve wrist extension, improve superior radial nerve mobility, and then once I do that, I am going to retest these muscles again. And more often than not, you will find if they were strongly positive, they will become mildly positive. How many times I've seen this where they, I don't even do a tendon rehab and I improve the biomechanical environment for the tendon by manipulating whatever restrictions I'm finding and it improves patient symptoms right away. And then when patients are hurting less, they tend to exercise better, right? If this patient's symptoms go down with all the manipulations I did, all the good biomechanical environment I created, this patient tends to exercise better, right? You can, you can maybe use more resistance with exercises, right? Okay. The exercise tolerance improves. Okay. So the primary cause here is restriction and wrist extension. Your, your scaphoid joint is causing restriction is causing too much stress on ECRB and ECRL, okay? Your restriction in the elbow, a restriction in superior radial nerve joint is also causing stress on the common extensor origin, okay? Your restriction in the mid cervical mobility or C5, C6 is also causing, C5, C6 is also causing, maybe causing pain in the elbow because we know that C5, C6 can have neuromodulatory effects on the elbow. Right. So we're going to fix all this. Okay, I'm going to show you demonstrate a superior radio under manipulation, which we the very simple technique. I think we're going to be talking about these techniques. Okay. And then, yeah, it's a very simple technique. You're trying to adjust the radial head. Okay. There is another technique which is called Mills maneuver, or we we if it's a chronic lateral elbow tendinopathy or called chronic chronic tendinopathy, we can do a something called as Mills manipulation, which we do teach in our program. We're going to be talking about the position is slightly different, but it's a soft tissue manipulation technique which we use. Okay, so the, coming back to the same principle, it's a tendinopathy. Create good biomechanical environment for the tendons and then proceed with the tendons with tendon rehab. Take, a, take out a leaf from Alfredson research because I think he's given us a very good exercise prescription criteria. Use that and then I think you're, you're writing a lot of stuff on the chart. You have to give me more findings. My problem is that I don't like to chase the pain because if it hurts here, the problem is not here. If you have pain on the third metatarsal, pain is not at the, th the problem is not at the third metatarsal. 
But sadly, that's what how we were taught in PT school. If pain is here, do something here. But more often than not, we know that as your level of understanding improves, you understand the level of complexity. You, some of you need to speak to the people who are in cohort one and two and they'll tell you. I'm treating this neck patient in the clinic. She has, she came to me with 10 on 10 neck pain. I haven't treated her neck and she's doing okay. Yeah. So whenever you're hurting at a certain side, it doesn't mean that the problem is that side. Okay. Yeah. So, and interestingly, that patient is a physical therapist. So she came to me with neck pain. We haven't touched the neck and she's doing okay with symptoms now. Okay. Okay. So I don't like, I mean, the idea is that you under, your clinical reasoning is important. Okay. You evaluate the patient thoroughly. You evaluate segments above, especially if you're treating a foot patient, which you are in this situation. In this situation, the right way to go about is check the subtalar, check, check the talocural, check the midfoot, hind foot, rear foot, check the, check the knee, check the hip, check the pelvis, check the lumbar spine. Okay. And then once you do all that, you will have the findings and then you'll have the answer. But to be able to go that, you need this additional inf information, additional education. And that's why we do this program because this is not taught in the primary education. I did not learn all this in PT school, not even like 10% of it. Yeah. It could be simultaneously neck and wrist. Absolutely. Our body is a biomechanical chain. If something happens here, it affects everything down the chain. Or if something happens here, it can affect everything up the chain. Absolutely. Our body is a biomechanical chain. We know, we know that. How many times I've treated back patients and they have, I treated the neck and their back gets better and vice versa. Right? It's a very, very common. If there is a one page article or two page article written by Dr. Vayner, 2007, on regional interdependence. Just read that article. You can read a one or two page article, right? You go back and read that article. That will explain what I'm explaining in much more detail. Yeah. And I mean, regional interdependence forms the foundation of everything we teach. So make sure you're assessing things up and down the chain. Okay. One more case study, and then we'll probably call it a day. Okay. So let's talk about heel pain here. Okay. And I've deliberately taken these case studies because Dr. Kareem Khan also chose these examples when he was trying to find this, trying to settle this tendinitis tendinosis debate. He was, he, he took like similar diagnosis. Okay. So my, so my patient is a 29 year old amateur runner presented with pain in the right posterior heel. Okay. Symptoms are gradual and has become worse in, in the past six months and reports no mechanisms of injury. The patient reports difficulty in uphill walking, running and going up and down the stairs. So you, your patient has pain in the posterior heel, okay? Symptoms are gradual, onset is six months, okay? Uphill walking, running, going up and down the stair hurts, okay? Whenever we suspect symptoms of tendonitis, we always, or tendinopathy, is the correct term or tendinosis is the correct term, we always check for resisted test, right? So resisted ankle plantar flexion with knee extension is positive. Resisted ankle plantar flexion with knee flexion is positive. So basically we're checking for gastro, gastrosoleus here. Both are positive. So we definitely know the origin of the pain is coming from the plantar flexors, from the Achilles tendon. Yeah. Let's look at the biomechanical factors that could cause it, right? So we check the dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion is 10 degrees. Plantar flexion is 50. Inversion is 40. Eversion is 5. Just from these basic findings, we know that dorsiflexion and eversion is restricted, right? So maybe because this is restricted, your talocrural and subtalar mobility is restricted. Every step this runner takes is causing too much pressure on the Achilles tendon. Okay? The talocrural mobility your talus is not gliding properly. Your, your calcaneus is not moving properly on the talus. Yeah. So every step this person is taking, pounding, putting way too much pressure on the, way too much pressure on the Achilles tendon, causing the tendon to go in that state of degeneration we spoke about. 
Okay. We did some segmental testing. We found the medial glide of calcaneus and talus was restricted. We found the posterior glide of talus was restricted. We also found the cuboid glide to be restricted. Okay. Yeah, so we are, I would also check, ideally I would also check knee and lumbar spine and hip. But for the simplicity, I only checked foot in this and I found like severe restriction in the foot. I'm finding restrictions everywhere. Okay. But to address this, before even starting the tendon rehab, I need to address the biomechanical faults. I want my ankle dorsiflexion to be 20 degrees, which is a normal dorsiflexion by improving the posterior glide of the talus. Okay, maybe manipulate the talocrural joint, which we talk about in our program. Okay, improve the eversion, improve the subtalar mobility. Okay, and improve the cuboid mobility. Okay, because this patient has cuboid dysfunction as well. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate a cuboid manipulation. Yeah. And this is very simple. All I'm doing is just putting pressure on the cuboid and just manipulate it. Yeah. Very simple. So the idea is we are trying to improve, same principle, we are trying to improve biomechanical environment for the tendon to heal. And we are finding all the biomechanical factors resolving the biomechanical factors with many manual therapy, with manipulations. But the key thing is your understanding. If you understanding what is causing the tendinosis, you'll be able to address the symptoms faster. Your patients will be able to address exercise better. Sometimes manual therapy interventions are performed every time patient comes in the clinic. We assess how, whether we are able to improve the biomechanical environment and sometimes it's just a one-time thing you align it and patient is better sometimes you have to do it over the period of time patient comes in you do it the patient feels like 20 percent better 30 percent better 40 percent better 50 percent better and then you keep keep advancing the exercises so that you can first create a good environment for the tendon i keep repeating this term and then you keep progressing there is a this eccentric exercises make sure you're loading the tendon enough make sure you're following the alfredson's protocol exercise prescription criteria and you're addressing the problem yeah yeah any questions regarding this case study okay we talk about these protocols in our course i mean there is a art published study published by alfredson you can look it up it's a research article published by alfredson in 2013, if I'm right, I may be, I may be wrong with the year, but I think it's 2013 or 2014. Alfredson, he's done, he's published like a bunch of stuff on, and we talk about his research in our program. So, yeah. So the idea here is we are trying to improve the biomechanical environment. That's it. So that the collagen tissue can calm down, your tenocytes can function better. And with loading, with eccentric training, with accurate exercise prescription, after we have improved. But the point is that if you don't do the manual therapy component, improve the biomechanics, this patient is not getting better. And a lot of times these patients are grade one injury and with PT treatment, they become grade two or if they're grade two, they become grade three with PT. Because if you don't do the manual therapy, you're not helping this patient or all the three case studies I mentioned. Okay. So that's why the level of understanding has to, be, has to be complex. And that's why the program we teach is one year because no way you could learn all this stuff and all this research and all this information in like a month or two or in a weekend course. Okay. And you can, you can learn the skills and then this is a process of learning. Yeah. Anything you want to add Dr. Steve? No, I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah. Any more questions, guys?
do you encourage rest in manual therapy uh, can you i mean can you elaborate your question what do you mean by rest in manual therapy do you mean like between sessions like should we do it on back to back days you can clarify your question but i think i get it i think the question is um um maybe there's two questions there one is uh do we rest in between sessions doing manual therapy like uh th i think there's times when dr singh and i have very acute patients where we'll do manual therapy three days in a row um as f that's as far as like our interventions towards the patient but as far as like rest goes um if for the patient themselves we have an acronym it's called police um if a patient has an injury or pain in their body we recommend um, protection of the injury so protect it you know don't do anything to make it worse and then that's followed by that's the p protection and then the o and the l is optimal loading so we're always trying to load tissues optimally as much as the tissue can be loaded it should be used they should be exercising they should be working out they shouldn't stop what they're doing unless it, the loading is too much for the tissue um, in question um, pain is a lot of times our guide but not always um, you know in chronic tendon ish injuries a lot of times we'll go ahead and do heavy loading even in the presence of pain um, that's for more chronic issues um, police and then ice compression elevation so yeah I mean just depends on the patient I think it's about your understanding. If you understand what you're doing and you back it with research and your manual skills, I think you tend to make good decisions. Yeah, thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thanks to everyone for being active in the chat box and asking questions and interacting with us. We really enjoy that. We really appreciate that. We hope that we'll see some of you guys when we come to Delhi and Mumbai um, in April. So block time on your calendar, block time on your schedule, make it happen. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Going to learn a lot. Yep. I'm just going to discuss the references and I think I'm going to call it a day. Sounds good. There are a lot of references for tendon rehab and a lot of references from Kareem Khan's stuff. If you want to read more about it, look at Dr. Kareem Khan's. I think it's published like probably 20 articles from 1999 to 2009. And it has changed the way we practice. So, I mean, a lot of his stuff is just, I mean, gold has become a gold standard, at least in North America. Some of his research has not translated the same way it has stopped in India, it's the way it has translated here, because uh, what happened here, I, I'm just going to give you a little background. What happened here was, so his research came out, the first article he published was 1999, and there were a lot of debate about his stuff. Okay. And uh, so, and then he continue, he became very popular, like overnight star, because with all this, his research and stuff. So, and then he did like follow up studies in collaboration with a lot of famous researchers in the US. And and because in, in the US, the insurance companies or reimbursement is based on evidence, a lot of insurance companies stopped paying for all the modalities. Because if it's not tendinitis, why should an insurance company pay for ultrasound? Why should an insurance company pay for IFT or TENS or shortwave or microwave, right? Okay, so... Most of the insurance companies don't even pay for all these things just for heat. They don't pay. They used to pay for all these before, before his work. So before, for iontophoresis, for phonophoresis, because this is not an inflammatory pathology. This is a degenerative pathology. So he's actually kind of his, there's a quantum shift from what insurance companies were paying before 90, before to the year 2000 and what they were paying after 2000. Okay. And the clinic I practice and the clinic Dr. Steve practices in, we don't even have modalities, right? And, and that's, where, that's where the profession is going, more towards manual therapy. And that's why we teach manual therapy because that's where the evidence is, okay? And 
most of the evidence has been published in last two decades. A lot of stuff we teach is very, very new. I graduated in 2008, and I think we have research articles or clinical prediction guidelines as soon as, as early as 2000, July 2013, 20, uh, July, is, July of 2023. So we teach a lot of recent stuff. And I mean, because the profession is moving at a very rapid rate, we keep, keep doing what we were doing, we are not following the evidence, right? And so it's important to follow the evidence. I mean, there's a lot of money being spent, a lot of research being done in the US uh, to, to create this stuff so that patients can get better care, yeah? Yep. Any more questions, guys? I want to thank IAP for conducting this. Hopefully, you guys learned something. I think we we do this because like, I think we can create a difference, and I think we can create. I mean, you become a better therapist can help a lot of people, and that's that's why we run this program. Yep. Any final words, Dr. Ravi? Uh, hello, sir. Dr. Pratiksha here. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Pratiksha Bighe. I'm here to express my vote of thanks for everyone who made this event possible. Special thanks to our beloved Dr. Tejendra Singh, sir, and Dr. Stephen Port, sir, from Gem Expert for accepting our invitation on very short notice and delivering such an important talk and enlightening us with the facts about tendinopathy. Uh, we are grateful to the central team and Maharashtra state team officials for always being supportive to us for our events. We would like to thank the IAP digital team led by Dr. Uttara Mohan Ma'am for always being helpful and available to organize these online webinars. Special thanks to our Dr. Bharti Dave Ma'am, Secretary of Maharashtra IAP team for always helping us. Thank you to our Thane district team members. And last but not the least, our participants who have taken part in today's discussion. Hope we were successful to deliver you the maximum out of this event. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Holi to everyone. Thank you, guys. Uh, I think the presentation will be shared on YouTube so you guys can follow us on Instagram and YouTube and we are on social media so you guys can follow. I think Dr. Dhumi has shared the social media links and you can follow IAP on social media as well. And yeah, we will share this on YouTube so you guys can have a relook at it. Yeah, thank you guys for your time. Thank you.